No matter how long I've been around farms, I never cease to be amazed by the cycle of life. Everything ebbs and flows. There are great moments, heartbreaking moments, and moments that words just can't describe. Are you ready for a slice of life from the farm? It's easy to see why keeping a few chickens has become extremely popular. Something to crow about, you might say. They're extraordinarily useful from start to finish. Whether you're raising layers, broilers, or really any chickens, proper nutrition is the foundation for a successful flock. Healthy chickens lay healthy eggs, and healthy eggs grow into healthy chickens. Sustaining this never-ending cycle is fascinating. It can be a lot of fun, particularly if you have the right tools. Nutrition's a big key. You know, when I think about feeding uh, my animals, I wouldn't give them anything that's any less quality than the kinds of food I would eat or the level of quality of food that I would feed myself. Whether they're the smallest chicks all the way up to adult layers, I'm looking for a wholesome feed for them. Uh, something that's balanced and has all the nutritional requirements they need. We also try to supplement their feed with grass, getting them out on to pasture as much as possible and as early as possible. There are plenty of great reasons to raise chickens. The main thing to do is take care of them and they'll take care of you. Coming up, Dean Norton and I talk about a cause very close to both of our hearts. I like the analogy of what we're trying to do with these heritage breeds as if you're looking at your stock portfolio. And later, preserving beautiful landscapes one tree at a time. Don't go anywhere. Unfortunately, chickens are regarded really as just food. Sorry about that. But a friend of mine, Dean Norton, director of horticulture at Mount Vernon, and I both think differently. We think these guys ought to be saved. Dean, it's great having you here at Moss Mountain Farm. Thank you very much, great to be here. Well, you know, I'm so inspired by what you all have done at George Washington's Mount Vernon with the landscape. Yeah, it's really special. You know, for the last 20 years, we've really been concentrating on all areas of the landscape. And, and probably the most recent restoration is, has been the upper garden. Uh, five years of archaeology, a lot of written research. It's fabulous. It's just beautiful. Well, the, what's interesting, too, about Mount Vernon is you all have moved out into the broader landscape, and, and you're now showcasing some of the heritage livestock. Right. Since about 1990, we started an interpretive program and have, have really helped uh, preserve and uh, conserve three breeds, the Milking Red Devon Cow, the Ossaba Island Hog, and the Hog Island Sheep. Well, take a look at some of these Dorkings. These would have been a, a breed, as you know, that um, Washington would have, would have known. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, these are great. Now, these, you, you all have had some of these at Mount Vernon before, I think. We, we have. Uh, you know, chickens have been kind of tough for us in that um, we have a lot of animals that eat them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's tough being a chicken. It's tough you know, being a chicken. Wants to eat you. Yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of interest about conservation of breeds, these older breeds. But with our farm complex, our farm system the way it is, I mean, it's very efficient. Why, why bother with these breeds? I like the analogy of what we're trying to do with these heritage breeds as if you're looking at your stock portfolio. 
I mean, your financial advisor is always telling you to diversify, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, the way it is now, all these farms are, are using specialized breeds. Right, it's one genotype. That's exactly right. Narrow genotype. And if you lose that, you've lost it all. Yeah. But by diversifying our gen genetic portfolio, we're, our agricultural fu future is going to be much stronger. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think genetic conservation is one of the reasons I've gotten so into trying to preserve these poultry lines, and it's great that places like Mount Vernon are preserving some of the mammalian lines. Uh, no question. I mean, it's so exciting to know that we had one of the last breeding pairs of Ossava Island hogs. Uh, a very rare breed. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and, and what was really interesting was that Bermuda had wild hogs and it actually helped save a, a ship that wrecked there many years ago and we helped them reintroduce uh, those hogs back to Bermuda. So there's reciprocity going on. Uh, definitely. So as what you're doing, sharing your breeds with others, sure. we're doing the same. Satellite, satellite flocks and breeds uh, um, elsewhere so that it continues to grow and continue to to increase that gene pool. Well, a lot of the animals that, that the early Americans got were actually had been, they had been deposited by Spaniard and Portuguese explorers yeah. dropping uh, breeding pairs off on barrier islands. Right. So the Osmal Island hogs come from uh, an island off the coast of Georgia, right. hog island off the coast of the Eastern shore. So, um, you know, we're looking out there and go, there's a pig out there yeah. or there's sheep and they, we brought them on in. The great thing about the breeds is they were very hardy and, and, yeah. and they could withstand a lot of Great pressure. land race breeds. Exactly. So, Dean, they would deposit these pears on these islands because they knew they could come back exactly. as a food source. Their hope was that they would reproduce. And they didn't have to bring the animals the next time around. Yeah, they'd, they'd be going to a food source. Exactly. Very good. Yep. Interesting. Well, in terms of sharing, one day I hope to share some of these Dorkings with Mount Vernon. That would be fan fabulous, really. It would be great to have them back. Uh, that's what they're here for. Cool. <laughs>
the lambs have shelter. So beyond just having this little corral where they can feel protected, we need a place for the mother and the lamb to go in where she can be near the mother and she can actually stay warm. A, a baby lamb should have a temperature of about 102 to 103. If uh, they drop below that, around 100 or 99, they're considered hypothermic. And actually 20% of young lambs die and it's usually because the conditions aren't right um, uh, within just a few days of birth. So it's important that we have this facility and we really watch them this time of year because this is kind of the lambing season and we'll start seeing more and more of these little guys, which is really exciting. So this is kind of the first lamb of the season. Um, we need to give her a Z name, so I'm gonna call her Baby Zoe. Baby Zoe would be just perfect for that little lamb. Next, you've heard of restoring historic houses, but restoring old trees? After the break, we're headed to Newport where they're doing their best to keep history alive. Heritage breeds aren't the only things needing the help of conservationists. Large trees like this big post oak at the farm, even though they've stood the test of time, they still are living things and are vulnerable. Weather, disease can bring them down. The Preservation Society of Newport County has started a special program to help preserve their local tree lines by replacing them with saplings taken from the elder trees themselves. We visited with them to see just how they're doing this. My name is Jeff Curtis. I'm the Director of Gardens and Grounds for the Preservation Society of Newport. I'm responsible for every blade of grass, every tree leaf, every petal on every flower. We also are in charge of decorating inside the houses, putting all the foliage plants inside. We grow a number of flowers to decorate inside the mansions with floral arrangements. We have a number of greenhouses that we take care of. We grow all the plants that we use in the mansions in our own greenhouses. So you, you can't be a specialist with this job. You have to know a little bit about everything. It's extremely challenging. You know, every day it's something else. For the most part, we stick to the original design of the landscape. We will not alter that unless we have to for some reason. We do the same thing with the buildings as we do with the grounds. You know, if the Great Hall and the Breakers needs to be painted, we're not gonna change the color. <laughs> Any time a specific tree dies, whether it's a European beech or a sugar maple or, a, or an elm, we stick to the exact same species of tree. One example where we do not stick to the same species is the American elm. It has the Dutch elm disease. I actually have a new variety of elm that I'm growing in this nursery. It's called Jefferson. Uh, it's a very good elm. The trees that we grow in our nursery, which is right behind me, are trees that are not readily available at local nurseries. Uh, there's one particular tree that we grow, it's called the uh, Turkish oak, which is native to uh, Western Europe. And uh, the first time we had to cut down a Turkish oak, this was about 25 years ago, first thing I had to do was to look up to see what nurseries grew the tree so I could buy one and replace it. But all went along. I searched all over the country and I could not find any. So the next step was to uh, collect the acorns from that particular tree and grow them ourselves. These mansions that you see around here, you don't see them anywhere else in the world, you know? For the most part, out in the main lawns and in, in the formal gardens, what you see today is what you saw a hundred years ago. Do you really know what's going on in your soil? Probably more than you think. Do you ever wonder what's just below the surface of soil? Some people call this dirt, but I prefer to call it soil. Soil is very important to me because it's really what makes all of this grow in my gardens. And there's so much complexity to soil. To me, that's fascinating. In fact, it's its own little ecosystem. It's full of all kinds of microbes and insects. The more we know about it, the better plants we can grow. 
First things first, to understand soil, you have to look at it in layers or horizons. You see there are six commonly recognized master layers which go all the way down to the actual bedrock. But for today, let's just focus on the top two. First is the organic matter that is deposited on the surface. This is usually made up of plant and animal residue. This blankets all of the horizons of the soil, protecting from erosion and feeding the layers below. The next layer is what we know as topsoil. This layer is where the most biological activity occurs, housing earthworms, arthropods, nematodes, fungi, and microorganisms, among the minerals and decomposed organic matter. As you can imagine, this layer is the primary source of nutrients for your plants, making it the most important to understand for your garden success. You know, recognizing the composition of your soil can tell you a lot about how certain plants will do in your garden. If you find that your soil, after testing, is deficient of certain things, it can often be easily amended. You see, I think using natural fertilizers, minerals, and compost can help boost the value of your soil. Compost adds the living elements, like microorganisms and beneficial insects. Fertilizers can bring up the mineral content up to where it needs to be to suit the plants that you're growing. I can tell you it's worthwhile to dig a little deeper and get to know those little guys in your soil that are working so hard. Believe me, when you get your soil right, your garden and your plants will thank you for it. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. When you run a farm, you soon find out that, well, there's a lot to do and there are a lot of moving parts, but it's very satisfying work. From seeing your first crop go from planted to harvest, to taking some eggs, hatching them, and raising your first flock of chickens. There's a lot that's very rewarding about farm life. Every moment is a learning experience, illustrating the beauty of the ebb and flow of the cycle of life. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.